stuff, or there's actually bass on some songs that doesn't exist on these songs where they'd mute it while they're mixing. Those things I didn't keep in because they weren't supposed to be in the mix, but to be able to hear that stuff was phenomenal and, there, and to see the notes and all those notes from the tape boxes were photographed and photocopied and sent over as well. So, Vin, having been so instrumental in Ronnie's life and music and this period in particular, because it was you, really you and him coming out of Sabbath that went and put this whole thing together and went around and got Jimmy and found Vivian and all of that. But what, this being a record you're a big part of, what are your thoughts about listening to Joe's remix? Uh, well, what's they better be nice. He's sitting right next to you and you're a New York guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I'm, not not it. oh, hey. I'm from Brooklyn. Hey, <laughs> let's go get a bagel. <laughs> um, the, uh, did you send him a 20 in the mail and say, turn the drums up a little more? I didn't, Wendy wouldn't give me his email or his, or his number or anything like that. Uh, yeah, you know, when we did the record, well, I, the only thing I heard was Holy Diver on YouTube, just the end of it. And then I heard that ending. I went, there's no ending on Holy Diver. Right. And what that is, it's we goofed around on a lot of songs and played even live at sound checks and stuff, the 2001. Down, down, boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah, that is what it is. And yeah. it was a joke because we, we had enough rollout to fade. And I always do this. I'll go double time. I'll go crazy. I'll go seven, four. I'll play fills all over because I know we're out. You know, never thought we'd use that. 40 years later. We used it. And I hear that. I go, you got to be kidding. That was a joke. <laughs> but I must say it was very tight. You know, we had that, da 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 it's legal now. Back then, you could have got We're smoking a lot of pot it. here. We smoked a lot of pot. And uh, we're in there that night, and we go, we need it. Ronnie wanted a sound like, you know, an invisible sound. No computers back then. So we're sitting there, and our friend Tom, who actually brought us the pot, goes, hey, I got a tire in my truck. <laughs> really? And we bring it in. We'll let the air out. So we brought the tire in. Angelo. Mike the tire. I think it was the first time that somebody mic'd a tire. And then Ronnie was coordinating it and go, okay, you ready? They rolled the tape. <laughs> he had a screwdriver. And that's the beginning of Invisible. That's awesome. I think he overdubbed it too. And it's Joe, twice. Joe, on the be on the uh the intro piece to the song Holy Diver, when I listened to that. Tell me if I'm crazy, but is that a little louder? Did you do anything in that with that intro piece at all? I, um, well, I, I got to be honest, that that was really difficult to make sound as good as the album. So I kind of added to what was on the album. So if that makes sense, I, I you know, I mean, it's trying to figure out where there's so many and there's 24 tracks of instruments happening. So you have to try to figure out what comes in, what comes out. Did they use this part? Did they use this sound? So it was very forensic in trying to get it. And then to make it, I think in mastering nowadays, mastering in general is louder. So, so everything got evened out a little more. Um, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time trying to preserve the integrity of it and not make it sound like a, a modern right. hi-fi, you know, super loud record. But it, it got a bump up in level, but it, I think it still has a lot of depth and it still Atmosphere. has a lot of low end it's that it's, yeah. it sounds great on on a stereo to me regardless if it's if it's streamed or not it's that now, was that was all ronnie to playing the keyboards oh is that right yeah vin take us back to making that record with ronnie you guys are both coming out of sabbath i would and and we all know that the way it ended for sabbath with ronnie initially on that first turnaround was not necessarily on the best of terms was there a was there a real extra spark and extra drive 
that here he is now stepping out under his own name with a new band to really lay down the gauntlet? Well, actually, it's fitting that we're here because uh, after the uh, tour, uh, we did the Live Evil album, recorded live, and we were mixing that. Then we came here to have some drinks and some food, probably a pizza, and Ronnie said to me, hey, look, I'm leaving the band. And uh, so it was here at the Rainbow where he asked me if I wanted to join him with his new band. And I went, oh, okay. But it was kind of a no-brainer here. How exciting is this? The best killer singer in rock. We're going to start a band together from scratch. And uh, I mean, Sabbath, you know, I'm honored to play with Black Sabbath, Tony and Geezer. But this was sounded like something really exciting and we can build it from the beginning and, and see what happens. So, and yeah, I was in my twenties, you're in your twenties. You don't weigh it too much, you know, two great choices, but, uh, and then we wound up, uh, in Ronnie's at the garage playing that, 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 that was the first riff we had. Is that right? Yeah. That was the first thing that, that you heard and Ronnie, Ronnie the, played guitar. Oh, he did. Because we know we know he played a lot of instruments, even though he didn't play them live. But he did no. play. But he wrote he wrote the riff to "Holy Diver" on guitar. Yeah, he had the riff, and then we started jamming, and we put in some accents, and and we we built it from there. We didn't have the solo. We we only went like two verses out. Then we auditioned guitar players in L.A. Talk about that, if you will, because that's interesting. That went through a little process, right? You went here. You were here in L.A., and then you went to England. Yeah, we were like the original White Stripe, me and Ronnie, <clears throat> guitar, and, and, and he switched the bass sometimes and drums. Uh, so then we auditioned. He said, all right, we're going to get some people down. And uh, we got a bunch of guitar players down, but it, nothing really, really gelled. We even had Jakey e. Lee come down. Jakey e. Lee came down. He was great. But then I think it was in the back of Ronnie's mind to have a European flavored band. And uh, so he, we decided, yeah, that sounds like the plan. So we went to England, we went to London. We, Ronnie and I stayed in the same room, you know, which is funny because he's up till three in the morning reading books with the light on. And I'm going, I can't sleep with the light on. <laughs> it was like the odd couple. <clears throat> it was great. And we went to a couple of clubs in London to see bands. One of them, we walk in, and it's a reggae band. I go, I don't think that's a guitar player. Right. And dreadlocks and the whole bit. So uh, then we waited for Jimmy Bain to come back. Jimmy came back into town and uh, we called Vivian's house in Ireland. And um, he flew over the next day. We jammed and we recorded it on a little cassette plate uh, tape. And then Ronnie and I, went back to the hotel later that night. We probably went for an Indian meal or something and listened to the tape and we were blown away. Wow, this is great. And Jimmy, I don't know. Jimmy just came along with the package. Right? Well, when, Wendy, you, <laughs> Wendy, grab, jump in here because you talked about J Jimmy kind of just... He just assumed he was going to be the bass player. <laughs> you know, it was like, Jimmy was like Jimmy Bob Bain. That was, that was his Jimmy name. Bob Bain, Jimmy he don't Bob care. Bain. He was just there and he was going to be the bass player. That's when I it. walked into Sound City, the first rehearsal, right? I walk in, Jimmy's sleeping in front of my drums on the drum riser at the edge of the stage. <laughs> I go to look at Ronnie. I go, is he okay? Should we call 911? Or he goes, no, nah, it's fine. And then he got up and just played and it was fine <laughs> and for those that don't know it the late jimmy bain was is actually the guy that came up with the very hooky keyboard part to rainbow in the dark right yeah he walked over we had the song so we were playing it on the cassette tape uh and then jimmy has a cigarette in his hand and a jim beam and coke and he walks over to the keyboard puts a cigarette in his mouth and there's a big ash nothing fell and he goes, that, 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 that riff, a Rainbow in the Dark. And we're like, wow, let's record it. We did it again. Still didn't drop an ash from a cigarette. <laughs> and that's how that got on the song. And let me ask you about the opening track on the record. Ronnie used to always tell me that he got a lot of inspiration to writing lyrics from watching sports. We were big sports fans, Ronnie and I, I still am. And we would always argue about sports because I was a, 
I'm a Mets fan. He was a Yankees fan. And we bonded over the Giants, but we differed on baseball. So we would always argue about that. But stand up and shout, to me, although the immediate connotation is stand up and shout at a rock show, Ronnie had told me that actually was someone inspired from watching sports. Do you remember that song coming together? Well, the song, the music of the song was actually from Vivian's old band called Sweet Savage. Sweet Savage. Right. And that riff, that, 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 that was in the song. So we listened to it and we liked the riff, but we didn't like the rest of the song. So we started working on the song. And then Ronnie came up with the idea of stand up and shout, maybe from, like you said, the sports thing. And uh, then we made it work. And then and we did the breakdown in the middle, stand up and shout, oi, you know, all that stuff. Oi. Yeah. Ronnie always said oi. Oi, he loves ois. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't Jewish. Oi. <laughs> so that's how that came about, you know. Uh, it came from that song, but we tore it apart, used the riff, and uh, built that song up. And then uh, all those things were recorded without a click. It's no click, as you probably noticed. And uh, no cut and paste anything. You go, you ready? Everybody's ready? Because what happened in Sound City, we built the hut out of plywood. We actually all went to Home Depot and bought eight sheets of four by eight plywood, put a floor down, then we built a hut, a roof. So the drums were in a wooden container. And I had a window. It was no window in there, but I could see Ronnie. I could see the rest of the band. And that's how we recorded that. So it was, uh, we got warmed up and then we, especially stand up and shout, it's a fast song. Once we were really warmed up and sweating, then it's like, all right, let's do it. Let me play the whole thing. Let me get it before we, we go, cause I could talk about the record forever and so many great songs on it. But before we, uh, we run out of time with, with you guys, Vin, tell me about the tour. Because Wendy and I talked about a little bit at the top. You played everywhere and anywhere. Tell me about the tour, how it started, and how it progressed. It was great. There was money everywhere. And uh, <laughs> you being sarcastic? <laughs> the per diems were fabulous. Flying private, Vin? Yeah, I didn't know where the money came from. <laughs> no, the tour was, uh, we started, the first gig was Antioch, California, right? And it was a warm-up show. So we, we rehearsed and everything, but we didn't have the endings down very well. So we go, well, it's Annie out California. There's probably be a couple hundred people up there and we'll run it through. Yeah. So we get up there, we do a sound check. Then we go back in there. It was like a trailer thing. Then we look out as people come in and the place is packed. It's 3,000 people there. Oh, no, we better play good. And uh, <laughs> tickets were 10 bucks. And the endings were like... Is it now? Uh, we're looking at each other. No, wait, wait, one more time. Let me relax for a minute. Now, boom. It was that kind of thing the whole night. And uh, we did a lot of medleys. Ronnie liked medleys going from heaven and hell to another song. And we had to remember all this stuff. So it was funny. The endings just went on and on and on and on. Well, you only had an, an, an essentially a new band. We only had one record of material to play, so you had to play Rainbow and Sabbath stuff, right? We played, uh, yeah, Sabbath stuff. We played Children of the Sea, Heaven and Hell, the Neon Nights. We played Man on a Silver Mountain, Long Live Rock and Roll, and uh, played everything. And it was fun. It was a variety of, of Ronnie's, Ronnie's stuff. And did you see an immediate change when Rainbow and the Dark hit in the amount of people, the song, when the amount of people were coming out to the shows? Was there a big spike? Because MTV, early days of MTV, they started hitting that video. I'm sure a lot changed. Yeah, the quick. video was on. And then uh, <clears throat> I used to drive around the valley. I lived in the valley near Ronnie and, and Wendy. <clears throat> Hear Rainbow in the Dark on the radio and all the time. And uh, so the tour went from, we had a couple of shows with Aerosmith. But Ronnie hated opening up for Aerosmith. Said, I don't know. She had to deal with that. Who were in bad shape at the time, too. The Aerosmith. So we did one show, and on that show, Joe Perry and Steven Tyler got in a fist fight on stage. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, a real fist fight. <clears throat> and Ronnie said, that's it. And uh, Wendy was able to pull together quickly a tour of theaters, and we had Queensryche open for us. <clears throat> and that was a great show. The places were full. It was packed. We did that for about two months, and then 
the albums climbing the charts, and then we were in arenas. It was amazing. It was like a typical rock story, you know, like. So the Holy Diver tour ended, Wendy, with the band headlining arenas. I mean, that's a really quick ascent, because even though Ronnie had huge name value still coming out of Rainbow Sabbath, as anybody that knows, when you leave an established band and start a new one, you're still really starting from the ground up. You got to build a base. So that had to feel amazing to even Giza Butler sent a message. He said, I knew you guys would make a good album or Gloria said, but I didn't know you're going to make that good of an album. <laughs> Is it? It was on par with what we were coming from. Somewhat. Well, that good of an album is now available in a special edition, which we touched on before. It's out now. Uh, you get the original record. You get the Joe Barisi remix, which we talked about. You get the Gene Kirkland almost drowning a guy photo. Uh, of course, the classic cover. So you got you to gotta get this amazing uh, reissue, which, again, is out now on Rhino. <laughs> CD, vinyl, whatever your preference. So check it out. Amazing stories. We have other guests to get to. Uh, Gene, Joe, Vinny, Wendy, thank you very much.